Hi. Welcome to Drinking the Kool-Aid. Welcome. I'm Megan. I'm Hannah. And I'm going to just kick off our little session here with saying, Hannah, my dream was your fault. What? How was it my fault? Okay, let me break this down for you. So right after we recorded our last episode, that night, I had <laughs> a weirdo dream. <laughs> And um, so I was, like, seeing all of these people get essentially squished. Oh, no. Yeah. So their, like, guts and blood was spewing out of them, and it was real gross and gnarly. Wait, how was this my fault? Because of the dream you talked about on the episode. Oh, my bad. Yeah. So it happened that night. Okay. All right. So then in the dream, like, as I'm seeing this unfold and I'm really grossed out, I was like, this cannot be happening. And I closed my eyes. And then when I opened them, there's a little British child riding on a pink sheep down a driveway. What the fuck? <laughs> so my dream completely changed. Well, that That's where you're ending it? That's it? Yeah. It, all of a sudden, everything was With fine. a fucking British child riding a pink sheep down a driveway? Yeah, to get to the school bus. What? <laughs> you know, because <laughs> that's obviously how they get to school. God, I'm sure. okay, that man, that. I mean, I have some weird dreams that make zero sense, but that really makes no sense. <laughs> <laughs> I was just telling Isaac I had a dream that we were, uh, that we were in a tornado, and I had to find Rona, and I was looking all over for him, oh. and he was under the bed, but. In the middle of the chaos and me screaming at Isaac in my dream to, like, go to the basement, I looked out the window and... <laughs> I looked out the window and I went, oh my god, it's a cow! And then I was like, a second Oh, you were in Twister? I was. The second okay. cow went by and I went, oh my god, it's another cow! But then I was like, no, wait, it really was the same cow! And because, like, apparently my brain knew... <laughs> It's, it's somewhere in there that that's from Toy Story, because I was like, it was the same cow. Sure. But, like, yeah, I don't know where that came from or mm. why it incorporated into my panic, but I was, like, really panicking in my dream, and, like, that happened, and it was just so random. But, yeah, no, a British child on a pink sheep, that... <laughs> I got nothing. Yeah. I liked it a lot better than the first dream. Yes. So, there's that. I just don't... Yeah, okay. Yeah, we'll just roll with that. All right. Okay. All right, so we are kicking off another four-parter here. And the book that I used is called I Know My First Name is Steven by Mike Eccles. Didn't I tell you to do the next episode, like... A holiday episode. Yeah. Why did you not listen? <laughs> I rarely listen to what people tell me to do. <laughs> You're like, well, I didn't take a break because we were in the middle of this four-parter. Yeah. So let me just go do another fucking four-parter instead of mm -hmm. actually taking the break. Right. Maybe I'll take a break after this one. You okay. don't know. All right. We'll see. We'll, well see it was how because, it shakes out. It was because it was a holiday. Yeah. But the holiday's gone. Yeah, I realized that, but I'm saying <laughs> I missed it. <laughs> you could have still whatever, just whatever. Okay, I will warn you with this one. I am breaking one of my largest rules, which is um how we always talk about. I will not use one name and then switch to another. We are doing that here for a very short time, and it's gonna all make sense, and you'll see why. Okay, it is really important. Boy, I thought you were gonna say coincidences. Oh, I thought you were going to be like, there was some in here that, you know, and I was like, what? No. <laughs> Dennis's dad left earlier than usual for his job, so he bundled up his younger brother and headed out with the intent of hitchhiking. This had become almost a nightly ritual, but it had rained the past 16 days, and on this night, it had finally stopped. Dennis was 14 years old, and he decided to carry five-year-old Timmy so that he didn't whine the whole time. 
He would carry him along Mountain View Road and away from the tiny cabin. Dennis was on a mission as he walked along the dark in the, along the dark in the road. Oh man. <laughs> That's how this episode is going to go. Here we are. Um okay, he was walking along the road in the dark. Cool cool, not not along the dark. <laughs> Got it. The boys were escaping from the person that everybody thought was Dennis's father. The narrow, twisted road was scarcely used at night, so it was difficult to find a way to hitchhike, but that didn't stop Dennis from trying. On this night, Dennis had only walked a quarter mile up the hill when a vehicle stopped to get them. He froze because he couldn't believe that someone was actually stopping this time, but he rushed to the car. He spoke to the driver and learned that he was driving through Boonville and heading into Ukiah. Okay, wait, so you're saying that uh, he was going out there like every night, but yes. nobody was stopping. Correct. Okay, got it. Okay. So it's this long, dark road that nobody really travels. Okay. It's very rare to see a vehicle on this road at got night. It. So yes, that's exactly what's happening here. The man spoke very little English, but Dennis could understand that he was following a friend's vehicle and they were having some car trouble. The boys hopped in and sat mostly in silence. The car stopped at a restaurant in Boonville where the driver met up with a friend to check out his car. Dennis sat in the vehicle thinking about what would happen if his dad caught the two of them. He brought a knife with just in case. Once the man was done, he got back in and they continued their journey. Dennis told the man that he and his brother were just traveling to their new home in Ukiah. Timmy whispered to Dennis that they should go to his babysitter's house, so they got out near the bottle shop. Sixteen days earlier, Timmy left his half-day kindergarten class to walk to his babysitter's house, but he never made it. His babysitter, Diane Crawford, had waited for him, but he had been kidnapped from the sidewalk by Dennis's dad. Okay. Mm-hmm. The boys walked to Diane's house, but sadly, no one was there. No! I know. Dennis told Timmy that he was going to bring him to the Ukiah police station instead, but Timmy refused. He said he knew where he lived and he just wanted to go home. They started walking in the direction that Timmy pointed, but when they got to an intersection, he got confused. They were heading in the right direction, but they were about five miles from Timmy's house, and he insisted that they keep going. They continued walking south along the shoulder of the freeway until they reached the Boonville exit. Dennis was convinced that they were lost, and Timmy finally gave in, and they went to the police station. They had to head back nearly two miles up South State Street, and they passed the Palace Hotel at a little past 11 o'clock. This is where Dennis's father was working his first shift as a security guard. Dennis stopped at the corner of Main and East Stanley. The Ukiah police station was three-fourths of a block away, and he told Timmy, go inside, tell them your name, and the police are going to get you home. He watched Timmy open the front door. He started to cry and then ran back to his brother. Aww. Officer Bob Warner had been inside the station, and he saw the little boy open the door and then run away. And it was late, so he was worried that the boys would get scared if he tried to approach them, like maybe they would run away. Okay. So he decided to radio for a patrol unit. Okay. Within two minutes, Officer Russell Van Voorhees pulled up beside the boys and asked the oldest boy what the youngest child's name was, and he said, quote, Timmy White. The officer recognized that name. This child had been missing over two weeks. Boy, you just give me chills. <laughs> There's a lot that are coming. Look at that. Look at it. <laughs> For real. <laughs> My hair is standing straight up over here. Ugh. Dennis spoke again to say, quote, My name is Stephen Stainer, and I've been missing from Merced for seven years. Holy shit. Mm -hmm. Holy shit. All the goosebumps. But, yep, yep. 
Dennis Gregory Parnell was actually Stephen Gregory Stainer. Okay, I wondered if that's what the name thing was. Yes. Yep. Okay, I got it. He misspelled his last name as S-T-A-I-N-E-R, but it actually should have been S-T-A-Y-N-E-R. He said, quote, I know my first name is Stephen. I'm pretty sure my last name is Stainer. Oh, my God. Mm-hmm. Dell and Kay Stainer had five children, including Stephen. As their family was growing, they decided to move in March of 1967. And actually, before we go further, I do want to say from here on out, I will be referring to him as Stephen. Okay. Um, in the book, they used Dennis for the entirety of when he was kidnapped and Stephen when he went back home. Right. Which you could do that, but I think it's really confusing. And also, it's not a name change that, like, he chose. Right. So I'm yeah, like, you know what? He's Stephen. Not. Yeah. So the home was on 20 acres of land, and Dell continued to work his full-time job at the CCNG plant, which was 20 miles away, and he worked an like 18-hour days, six days a week. Outside, so it's so That's long. That's a long so time long. to work. Holy and shit. And especially when you have a family, like little children to yeah. raise, like, woof da. That's rough. Outside of his long hours, Dell also worked many hours on his land during canning season. He always had help from his little boy, who he affectionately called Stevie. They worked side by side to prune, spray, and harvest the almond crop. His son was trusting, respectful, and always wanted to help others. Dell said, quote, When he was small, Stevie wanted to go everywhere I went. I wouldn't let him ride on the tractor where I was going under the trees because the almond branches was so low, I was afraid he was going to get hit in the face. Oh, no. But he'd walk behind and he'd just keep on walking. He'd walk miles following me. Then, when I'd come in from work and lay on the couch and watch TV, Stevie would come and curl up with me on the couch and I would bite him on the ear and he'd laugh. He was always just like a puppy dog. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's so cute. Dell did struggle to dry farm the almonds by himself and work his full-time job. One morning in 1970, he was shaving and fell to the floor and passed out due to the pain from a slipped disc. He had to get back surgery, and Stephen was so scared for years because he actually thought his dad had had a heart attack and nobody knew oh. that he thought this, so this actually stayed in his head. He thought his dad had a heart attack. There was a second house on the property, so Dell asked his good friends and their children to move in. The adults all worked together to do the farming work, and then the kids had a bunch of other kids to play with. The summer of 1971 was exceptionally dry, so both families were forced to move, and they sold the ranch, and the Stainers moved back to Merced. The move was extra hard on Stephen. He really thrived when the family had a lot of land and a lot of kids to play with. By September of 1972, he made a few new friends and was finally starting to feel a little better. In the mornings, the kids all walked to school together, but in the afternoon at 2 p.m., Stephen got to walk home alone because he got out of school earlier than his siblings. He liked walking home alone. But he did go directly to his friends' houses to play, and that got him into some trouble. I mean, what kid didn't, though, when they got off of school? Of course, The yeah. amount of times that I went over to the neighbors' houses and mom was, like, losing her mind. Yeah. And I was just over there like, do-do-do-do-do. Get your ass home and check in. Yep. And ask. And so he was warned several times that he needed to ask permission first, and he started getting punished when he didn't come straight home. On December 4th, 1972, seven-year-old Stephen Stainer had breakfast with his family before heading to school. Around this time, Kenneth Eugene Parnell and Murph decided to go to Merced Mall to do a little shopping. Ken got some gospel tracts and suggested that they go hand them out. He was studying gospel tracts and decided to become a minister. Or so he says. Okay, that was ominous. Yeah, Ken said that they would hand out the tracks to the kids that were walking home from school. 
He said he wanted to raise an underprivileged child because he could do better than his parents, and so he wanted to help one of the boys out. There were a lot of battered children who needed homes. Ken asked his friend if he would help him pick out a child to be a son. Like, just go select one. That sounded so weird. Yeah, absolutely. I did not enjoy that sentence. No, no. you cannot just pick children. Well, Murph had been abused as a child. God, you made it sound like a fucking puppy or something. I know. Like, let's, like, let's just, just pick go one out. Pick this child. Yeah. You like that one's hair? Cool. Sounds good. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. <laughs> so Murph had been abused as a kid. And this is something that Ken knew about. So he was the perfect person to kind of buy into his story. Of course he wants to save somebody from living an abused life. Stephen's mom, Kay, was in line at the auto parts store, waiting to purchase the oil, filter, and some nuts and bolts. It was a little past 2 p.m. and gross. it was gross. So he used freaking gospel music? Yes. To like kidnap him? Yes. Oh. Oh god, okay. Yeah, it's real gross. Um so she's standing in line at the auto parts store and it was a little past 2 p.m. It was raining and sleeting, so it's really gross out. Kay ran to her car and arrived at the school around 2.10, and she was hoping that Stephen would still be there waiting for her, but unfortunately, he wasn't. He had already headed home. He was like, I'm waterproof, it's all good. Exactly. (laughs) She watched for him on her way home, and she got back to the house at 2.20, and Kay went in and asked her husband if Stephen was there, and he said no. Now, like we said earlier... Stephen had been known for stopping off at other kids' homes, and so this wasn't actually out of the ordinary Which for him to be Which is why it's such a problem! Exactly. Like, like, now I just wish I could yell at my, like, little self, like, what are you doing? Yeah, exactly. Kay went inside to make some sandwiches, and a little before 3 p.m., Del, Kay, and Corey went to the school to pick up Cindy and Jody, and the girls said that they had not seen Steven since lunch. Del started to get really upset. Did Steven disobey him again? Like, they had just gone through this. Or did something else happen to him? They started calling around, and... Nobody had seen Stephen. His classmate, Royal Harris, said that he did wave goodbye to him as they got as he got on the school bus and Stephen was walking away. Um, but he did not know where Stephen went after that point. At 2 p.m., when Stephen would have been outside of his school, Kenneth Parnell was less than a quarter mile from Charles Wright Elementary. He pulled off Yosemite Parkway onto Jean Street and stopped just west of the Red Ball gas station. He handed a handful of these gospel tracts to his friend Murph, and a few minutes later, when Stephen's mother didn't arrive at the school to pick him up, he started walking home in the sleet. Now Murph says, quote, After Parnell let me out, he drives off, and I didn't know where he was going, and I'm just standing there in the sleet handing out these gospel tracts, and, you know... I gave a lot of them tracks to them kids walking home from school. A lot would say, hi, or I've got to get home, and pretty soon I had only a few left. And see, I'm handing them out. And Stephen shows up, and I'm talking to him, and I said, where are you going? And he said, I'm going home. And I said, the minister will give you a ride home. And then Parnell drives up and calls Stephen over to the car. Then I opened up the door, and Stephen got in, and Parnell says to me, let's go. I'm going to take the kid home. And I got in the front and shut the doors and we drove off. So the other one has like zero clue what's happening, right? He has no yeah, idea okay. what's so going on. Had, okay. He's yeah. completely in the dark. Um, you giving him like an accent accidentally or how oops. whatever you're doing over there <laughs> is making him sound so much more innocent. <laughs> I, will, I can't help but feel bad. I will say as we go through this and find out... Um, He sort of was told the plan, but I don't think that it actually computed. Like, he didn't didn't realize this was happening. When Stephen thought about this day, he said, quote, I don't remember too much about the school days, the usual, monotonous days, but that one stands out. The walk home was usual, at least the first part. I walked down the back way and then crossed Yosemite Parkway, there by the gas station. 
At that age, I usually walked with my head down looking at my feet, so I really didn't notice Murphy standing there until I was right on him. And then he came up to me and gave me some religious brochures. They had a little story in them, in cartoon form, that says something out of the Bible. Murphy said he was from a church and he was trying to gather no. donations. Oh my god, this is so gross. He asked me if maybe my mother would like to donate something to his cause. He asked me where I lived, and I told him that I lived right around the corner about three blocks. Then he asked, well, do you think we could speak with your mother? And I hadn't seen anybody else by then, but I said, yeah, I'm sure she would love to give a donation. Then he goes, well, could you take us there? And I agreed to. My impression was that he was a nice man, even though I later found out that he wasn't too bright. But at that age, that wasn't important to me. Then, all of a sudden, I noticed a white car pull around the corner and up beside us. Murphy opened the back door for me. I got in. He got in front. Then he shut the doors and introduced Parnell to me. They both used their real names, too. Then they drove off and they passed my street. I mentioned it to them and Parnell said, Oh, well, we're going to our place for a while and see if you can stay the night. We're going to call your mother from there. I go, well, why don't we just go back and ask her? Then Parnell says, well, we got some things to do down there. We'll call her from there. Then they hit the highway for Kathy's Valley. They sure were sure of themselves. I mean, the way Parnell acted, as soon as he got me in the car, he acted like that was it. Then I just sort of sat back and enjoyed the ride. I'd never even been that way before, you know? It's awful to listen to this because he's so innocent. Well, yeah, I mean, he's he's seven. Yeah, I know. It's just awful because, like, the innocence there. And, yeah. like, he has no freaking clue what is coming. He's just enjoying the ride thinking he's going to have a fun sleepover. Right. And that these are people from the church. <sighs> you know? And he comes from a very religious family. It's gross that I have to take mental notes of shit like that to, like, tell my future children. Because, mm -hmm. like, obviously, stranger danger, but, like... There's so many scenarios like the candy puppies looking for a lost person, dog, whatever. I never didn't random, even cross my mind. Random adults do not ever need help from a child. And that's right. it. Right. That and that's is it. it. Yeah, I know. It's just like, just for examples, like that is something that's going to be stored in the back of my brain now. Just, Absolutely. Yep. Murphy says, quote, on the way out of Merced, I figured that there was something wrong, but then I said to myself, the kid ain't doing nothing. I know there was something wrong, but after we left Merced, I never heard him cry either. Even when we got him there, he never cried. So it's like this grown adult is taking cues from a seven-year-old. Like, if he's not scared, then I shouldn't really be scared. So that yeah. kind of tells you what does, we're yeah. working with here. Yep. So Ken says, quote, at Merced Mall, we began looking for a likely prospect to be my son. During this incident, oh. Murphy talked to two other children in the shopping center. However, I thought them to be unsuitable. Oh, my God, I can't. There was no force used on Stephen by either Murphy or myself, and neither was any force necessary to keep him in our custody after leaving the area. This so, is disgusting. Oh, yeah. So as this is all going on, Stephen's parents had been driving all over town looking for Stephen, and they finally went home a little before 5 p.m., and they called the Merced police. Officer Michael Hyde arrived about 15 minutes later, and he radioed the dispatcher to say, quote, responded to the area of 1655 Bet Street in response to a missing juvenile from that location. The subject was approximately 4 feet 8 inches, 60 pounds, with shaggy brown hair and brown eyes. Last seen wearing a light tan coat with blue jeans and a possible zip-up type t-shirt. I'm sorry, how tall? Uh, 4 feet 8 inches. <laughs> Did I say it wrong? No, I just can't believe... Oh, that a 7-year-old is seven like basically year old is almost our height? Yeah. Yeah. So close. Mm -hmm. That know. is... Yeah, that's unfortunate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, um, you know, later 
when I, I saw some photos and some footage of him, like, he is a very tall, lanky That kid. would make sense, for yeah. sure. Mm-hmm. I just, yeah, that is insane. Yeah. The neighborhood, school playground, Yosemite Parkway, and several other areas were searched, and Stephen's mother called every one of his classmates. The police retraced every possible route that he could have taken home, and they went to all the homes and businesses along the way. A female attendant at the Red Ball service station said that she did see him walking eastbound, following his normal route home, sometime before 3 p.m., By 6 p.m., reserve police officers and local Boy Scouts were called to search the area, and Buzz Williamson, from the local radio station KYOS, started broadcasting Stephen's description to the public. Stephen's parents, Del and Kay, this will just shatter you. Oh, good. They spent the night in a nearby junkyard fearfully opening the doors on all the abandoned refrigerators and calling their son's name. Yeah, you like, were right. Just the th- the fact that they even had to think that and you let their right. minds go there. Yep. It's just heartbreaking. You shattered me. Yeah. Holy crap, that's... It's brutal. That's going to take a while to recover from. I mean, good for them for just doing it and going there and checking so that it's not lingering in their but mind. can you imagine each fucking door that you had to open? No. I mean, you just don't know in each single time. You get all that anxiety and everything each time, every single damn door. I wouldn't want to open an abandoned fridge even if I wasn't missing somebody. I know, right? Like, no thank you. I don't want to know what's in those. I don't either. Mm -mm. By this time, Stephen was a little more than a half hour drive up California 140, and he was just sitting down for dinner with Ken and Murphy. They were in a little red cabin at Kathy's Valley that Ken had rented as his private retreat just 50 miles up the highway. In an odd twist of fate, Kay's father, Bob Augustine, so this is Stephen's grandfather, had just moved his trailer two weeks prior to the disappearance to Judy's trailer park in Kathy's Valley. So he was living 200 feet. From the Red Cabins. No. Yeah. That's, oh my God, beyond close. No. Mm -hmm. It just makes it extra brutal that he was right there. Yeah. Oh, man. Ken had recently asked Murph to buy some toys from a flea market. So there was a pile of toys inside of the cabin. When Stephen saw this, he was so excited, and he wanted to pick something out for all of his siblings, but that actually pissed Ken off, because he was like, no, you only pick toys for yourself, no one else. Oh, okay, that's... Well, because he's not planning that he's going home. Right, so he's like, you don't have siblings anymore. Exactly, you are my son. The two men headed outside to chat while Stephen played with the new toys. And okay, but it's, sorry, uh-huh. it's just so freaking sweet that he saw toys and was like, let me get some for my siblings. I know. Like, what? At seven? What? Yeah, he wants to take something home for the other like, kids. most kids would just, like, dive right into that and be like, yes, mine, oh, mine. Right. <laughs> So the two men head outside, and Ken told Murph that if he said anything about this, he was going to end up getting the same charges. He apologized for getting him involved in the plan, but reminded him that he would lose everything if he told. Ken tried talking to Stephen while he played. He wanted to know about his mother, father, and siblings. What was his family like? What were his likes and dislikes? Had he ever been whipped? Now, Stephen actually lied and said, no, he had never been whipped because he didn't want to sound like a bad boy. Oh, my God. Which is like, no, stop. Are you trying to take Uh, me out? Yeah, (gasps) apparently. (gasps) But Ken already knew this was a lie. Ken knew about Stephen and this was not a chance encounter. What? No, he'd been watching? Well, okay. The Stainer family's mailman had recently transferred to Yosemite National Park from Merced, and he had mentioned to Ken 
that he observed a family who lived on Bet Street down in Merced, and they had really strict discipline styles. Great, so, now I have to worry about the fucking mailman talking about us. Right! I'm like, what the shit? Great. How does something like this even come up? That makes me feel very safe inside. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And obviously, if you haven't picked up on it, Ken was a predator. So, the things that took place are truly horrifying, and I will warn you that sexual assault is involved. Unfortunately, I kind of figured. Yeah, and if you want to know about all of the things, I would say uh, definitely pick up this book, because it is a good book, but there were things in there that I was like, yeah, I could have really lived my life without Very knowing detailed. that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's only a few things that we'll touch on because they're important to know for the story. And I'll try to throw in little warnings if possible. But just know if this isn't your thing, you know, maybe, maybe this isn't the story for you. Maybe jump ahead four episodes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe. Okay. Um, on the first night, Ken forced Stephen to eat all of his food, including his vegetables, or he was going to get a spanking. He was so scared that he gobbled down all the food. Afterwards, he took a shower and came out wrapped in a towel. Real gross, Ken made him remove the towel and crawl into bed with him naked. Sorry, this was on the first night? Yes. This is what happened right away. <gasps> Okay. Now, Murph was there, and he slept outside of the room on a fold-up couch. It was cold that night, and the only heat in the cabin was coming from a tiny gas cook stove, which Murph had to tend to several times throughout the night. Murph says he didn't hear anything that night, but he's just wrong, because Stephen recalled years later that this was the first of many, many, many times that Ken forced him into oral copulation. And I'm just going to use, like, the bigger words in this because it's a child and I just feel so weird yeah, about the I get whole that. thing. I get it. So I hate talking about child abuse. In Merced, the police were still canvassing the town, searching for Stephen, and it was past 11 p.m. And they could not find him anywhere. A little before midnight, police captain Dave Knutson called up Stephen's father and he asked Dell to come to the station. So he gets there and... Dave says, did you kill Steven? Whoa. Yeah, and Dell was like, whoa. Yeah, exactly like that. He's like shocked. And he said, no, of course I didn't do that. So he agreed right then and there to a polygraph test. Okay, what the fuck? Yeah. Um, and maybe that's a tactic, you know. You know, I, okay, but I get like blaming the parents and like family yes. being the first people you look at. But just like... Did you when, do it? When like, you're in the middle of freaking panicking because your child is missing. Yeah. And then you get called down to the police station. Well, and he's rattled. He's just been looking through refrigerators for his Why son. Why would you just drop it on him like that? Right. Exactly. And then just straight up accuse like, mm -hmm. wow, mm -hmm. didn't even like take him to dinner first. No, no just time wasted here. Drop the bomb. Yeah. Shit. So he says he will do a polygraph, but um, they had to wait for an examiner to arrive. The next day, Dell and his friend, Max Gogans, were on their way to speak with Kay's father. They wanted to tell him in person that his grandson was missing. So they headed to his trailer that was 200 Dude, right feet from it. the cabin that yep. Stephen was taken to. Around this exact time. Ken and Murph had to go to work, so they put Stephen in the front seat of the vehicle, and both vehicles were on the highway around the same time and could have passed each other. Isn't that crazy? I, uh, it's like, oh my god, they were so close. I hate when the universe is an asshole like that. Yeah. Later, they dropped Murph off at the cabin, and, um, trigger warning right here. Uh, I'll go fast. Ken forced Stephen into fellatio. Stephen cried the whole time and begged to go home. 
Ken showed him what he wanted him to do to him from then on and made it very clear that they were not going to fight about it every time. Once it was over, he undressed Stephen, put him to bed, and gave him nighttime sleeping pills so that he could go to work. He worked a quarter mile away. Right, at... so he's, like, trying to drug his ass? Yes, he absolutely does, yes. So that he doesn't try to take off in the middle of the night? That is correct. Ugh. Yep. Gave him sleeping pills because then he works the night shift. Okay. So he works at Yosemite Lodge with Murph, and they both could easily just slip away and go check on Steven if they needed to. Murph did not have any friends besides Ken, and that's kind of how he got himself wrapped up into this whole situation. Steven does have fond memories of him and says that Murph never assaulted him. I mean, he obviously didn't help him. No, but I am glad that he at least had somebody that, like... Yeah, did not and gave, do anything. And gave him fond memories, at least. Right. So we had something to hang on to. Yes. When Stephen first disappeared, volunteers and peace officers searched Merced County, and there was even a search of the home of a known pedophile and child pornographer just outside the county, but police did not find any clues or ties there. Volunteers had detailed maps and carefully checked off each area that had been searched. Years later, Stephen's brother Carrie said, quote, I don't like to be around a lot of people, so I stayed outside as much as I could. And I remember going out one night after Steve disappeared and wishing on a star that my brother would come back home. And I did that almost every clear night from then until Steve finally came back home. Oh my god. I never did tell anybody about it, but I remember wishing on a star that my little brother would come back home. Oh. I know. Dude, you're really taking me down. Yeah. Holy fuck, man. Yeah, this one, this one's a really crazy story. On the day before Stephen's disappearance, he had gone to a friend's house. Uh, Sharon Carr was having a birthday party, and he gave her a stuffed koala bear. Which nice choice, yeah. And she became extremely attached and um, to this thing and like protective of it, yeah, because she, her friend gave it to her and then disappeared. Yes, exactly. She had a really difficult time when Stephen went missing. The whole town had a difficult time after the disappearance, but his father Dell really struggled. The two of them had been so close. You know, he was his little sidekick. Dell also had a lot of guilt because he hadn't gotten him baptized yet, and they were very, very, very religious. The morning after he vanished, Dell asked his Mormon bishop, Ben Walton, to call Stevie's name into the prayer roll in Salt Lake City so that, quote, if Stevie was still alive by the time his name got on the prayer roll, nothing bad would happen to him. Oh my God, Megan. These quotes are just, ugh, I, shattering. I know. I don't know how I'm going to recover from all of this. Yeah, this one's hard. <laughs> Stephen was supposed to get baptized as soon as he turned eight years old, but he disappeared before that could happen. Dell pulled away from his family when his son went missing. He said, quote, I had a lot to do with my kids before Stevie's disappearance, but afterward, I was a hard guy to get along with. I just couldn't stand to see my family broken up with Stevie's being missing. The kids learned that they were not allowed to talk about the disappearance. Like, this was off limits in their house. They couldn't ask any questions. Dell says that he was very mean to his family when Stephen disappeared, but the oldest child, Carrie, took the brunt of it. Carrie said his father wasn't necessarily mean, but he became a different person. He became very emotional and angry. Then he turned his back on religion and he lost his faith. I, uh, it's hard. It is. I mean, you just don't know how you're going to react to something like that. And so Kay ended up having to really step up to the plate and keep the family together. She had to put on that strong front. She gave her kids lessons to teach them not to accept candy or rides from strangers. And they must always come straight home from school, never anywhere else. She continued to cook, clean, and care for the family. For the first two to three years, 
She actually never left the house unless somebody could stay by the phone because she did not want to miss a call from Stephen. No. Yeah. So they always had to guard it. Megan! I know. (laughs) Several tips did come in, and many of them were from psychics. They wanted to volunteer information. One of the psychics asked to be driven east on Highway 140, and as Merced police drove her past a trio of little red cabins at Judy's trailer park in Kathy's Valley, she lost the trail. The police retraced the route, and they did this several times, but every time they passed the cabins, she lost the trail. And no, the cabins were never checked. I was going to say, they didn't think that was weird. Right, and... I get it. It's a psychic. But does it fucking matter? It, it, But it, it's something that's very strange. It's a human being involved. So could we go knock on the doors? Go out on the random ass limb. Yeah. And just do it. Yeah. I. It's not like driving up and down the highway over and over was doing any good anyways. If she kept losing it as soon as they got to the damn cabins, just fucking go to the cabins. And the fact that they are taking this specific psychic out and driving around tells me that maybe they've worked with them before. Right. And, you know, I I don't know. I Just take the couple minutes to knock on some doors. It's like, I get it. Like, What's psychics, up? you know, it's, a, it's an up in the air thing. Of course. But they have led many people to many things and found missing people before. And you don't and have any other leads. Just so. take the damn chance. Yeah. But they didn't. Oh, okay. I'm breathing. (laughs) What they did do was the police pulled a list of all known sex offenders in Merced and surrounding counties. But Ken Parnell had never been registered as a convicted child molester, even though he was arrested, tried, and convicted of kidnapping and sexually assaulting a nine-year-old boy when he was 19. Wow. So, how's that for you? That is some foreshadowing as fuck. Mm Mm-hmm. Yep, there it is. After court-ordered stays in two mental hospitals where he made three escapes, he was diagnosed as a sexual psychopath and was sentenced to prison. Okay, nowhere in here they gave him a label? No. All right. Sure didn't. All right. Um, And I do actually have some uh, information here. So FBI agent Walsh contacted Lee Shackleton, chief park ranger in charge of law enforcement in Yosemite National Park. And he asked to obtain a list of all Curry Company employees. But this was not requested until the following March. And once it was received, the list only contained the names of half of the employees. Of course. The way that this happened is just so bad. The Curry Company paid their employees on alternating weeks. So they ended up handing over the list that included the half that were paid on the week of December 4th, 1972. Well, Ken Parnell was Was not. the opposite. Yeah, because he was paid on the alternating week. So his name showed up on the FBI's list of convicted sex offenders. However... He was not on the list of employees that it was being compared to. It's just so many things in this case already. Yes. So fucking close and so far. Yeah, I know. It's like the ball just gets dropped so many (sighs) times here. Okay. FBI agent Walsh felt that this was a huge failure later on. And he said, quote, The boy was in the park for quite a while, living with a park employee. Shackleton and his men couldn't find him. A seven-year-old boy. That boy should have been found by them. The problem was, we were dealing with the rangers. They were supposed to get that list for us, and they didn't get us a good list. At that time, we were virtually persona non grata with the park rangers. Shackleton was uncooperative with the Merced office of the FBI. At that time... The Yosemite Park Company, then known as the Curry Company, had more than 40% of their employees that had a record of felony arrests and or convictions. We and the United States Attorney were sure grim to see the number of people with sex violations working in the park. I do know that they have a propensity for hiring perverts, 
but the best opportunity to solve the case was in New Yosemite National Park. Didn't somebody see a little seven-year-old boy nude around a dormitory? And yes, that is a huge number of, you know, people with convictions working in this park. I saw your eyeballs, like, almost pop out of your head when I said that. Because, like, I'm all about, um, like, companies that are willing to hire felons and, like, give give a a second second chance. chance. Yes. But when it comes to that, first off, that's people's homes. Okay, that's a different story. Like, Mm -hmm. that's, or like, you know what I mean? Like, the cabins and everything, like, that's, that's a different story when you're around that. And, and not only that, but... How did I hear you say that like they had a lot of people on there with like forty like, percent? Wow. And the thing is, is I think when you're doing that whole second chance thing, then you as a boss are taking on that responsibility Correct. and you're working with that person and making sure that the change has happened. Yeah. You know, before you're letting them go be a huge bigger part of it not like hey work your own shift here right. at night good luck i hope this works out well in the name if yeah i think like with the sex offender charges like absolutely the fuck not that's just in a park no right no and that's it that yeah i can't mm-hmm. and, and oh boy yeah. that yeah. is horrifying yeah to say the least i know Chief Colbeth agreed with this statement and added that, quote, one of the first theories concerning Stephen's disappearance centered around the park. We knew from past experience that there were a lot of criminals and sex offenders up there working not for the park service, but in other jobs up there. But due to the mere fact that Stephen was last seen on the road leading up to Yosemite National Park, we asked for assistance from the park service in getting some of the flyers with his photograph on them distributed up there. We weren't up there. The FBI didn't have an office up there either. Lee Shackleton was the one in charge, but somehow Parnell just slipped through their fingers. So it's a lot of back and forth pointing fingers here on like who actually dropped the ball. But either way, I I think in this situation, if you're asking for a list of employees, you might want to make sure, hey, was this all the employees? Yeah. And why... Why are we half-assing things when there is a seven-year-old child involved? Exactly. Like, this is major here. And the fact that they're saying, oh, our first thought is somehow this kid is in Yosemite because of all of these predators up there, then get up there and look. Correct. Like, what are you talking about? Yep. So, let's go into the background of Kenneth Eugene Parnell. He was born on September 26, 1931, in Amarillo, Texas. His mother, Mary, was a very overbearing and controlling woman. By the time Ken was born, she was in her second marriage and it was falling apart. When he was five years old, his parents got a divorce and Mary and her children were heading to California to start over. Get ready for this part. I don't know if I want to be getting ready for anything. Ken... Five-year-old Ken okay. was so distraught okay. by this divorce mm-hmm. that he spent several hours pulling out four of his teeth with a pair of <gasps> pliers. <gasps> okay. I'm so- how old? Five. This I can to hardly, me is so scary. I can hardly convince the kids I nanny for to let me pull on one of their teeth when it's loose. Yeah. And I'm like, let me rip that thing out of there. Like, it's hardly hanging in. They won't even let me touch it. But no, he takes a pliers. And just pl- pulls his pulls, teeth out. Pulls them all. Yeah. On. How many? Uh, four. Four teeth came out. I, c- I can't imagine that pain. <laughs> first off. <laughs> I'm cringing so hard. I but can't. If, if this doesn't say problem, 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 I don't know what does. Oh, I know it does, but it's I'm cr- I can't focus on anything but how hard I am cringing at that. And no, I do not want emails about people saying I pulled my teeth out with pliers. You can keep that okay, to yourself, like, please. And I doubt they were like not <laughs> like I doubt that they like weren't loose or something. I'm you know? sure you didn't have four loose teeth at the same time, right? Because like so. every I mean, I don't. And this is in response to the divorce. Like a lot of people have pulled teeth out with weird things, yeah, but. Not when they're not loose. And now, like, 
instead of dreaming that my teeth are falling out, I'm going to dream that I'm freaking, like, pulling them out or some shit. Yeah. Thanks for that. You're welcome. And here's how casual his response is about this. He says later, quote, My recollection of the day of the separation, just as any kid would obviously be, I was upset. I wanted to go with my dad, and of course, I didn't. I just simply did not want to leave where I was at. I didn't want to come to California. Children children tend not to want to have their world upset. That's okay. it. Yeah, children tend to not have want to have their world upset. Uh, and, like, they tend to not yank their fucking teeth out without pliers either. <laughs> so gross. Uh, that's deeply disturbing. Well, oh, interesting. I used deeply in the next sentence. Oh, I was like, why are you? <laughs> you were just, like, lighten the tone so much. Oh, yeah. interesting. <laughs> well, Mary was deeply religious, and she expected her family to be as well. Once they moved to Bakersfield, she began working as a nurse's aide, and she became a member of the Assembly of God Church. Her children went to services every Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday evening. They also had family rituals where they would pray before school, and then Mary did daily Bible teachings. That's a lot. Yeah. After a few years in Bakersfield, Mary packed up the kids and they moved back to Texas and they stayed there for three years, then moved back to Bakersfield. Well, just back and forth. Sure. This time, she invested her savings in a boarding house to take advantage of the war-related oil boom. In the spring of 1945, when Ken was 13, he bef- befriended one of his mother's boarders and he coerced the young boy into fellatio. Oh, my God. Uh, He was found out, taken into custody, and locked up in Bakersfield Juvenile Hall. A psychiatrist, Dr. Richard D. Lauenberg, recommended temporary placement for Ken in Juvenile Hall, quote, in the hope that his marked emotional immaturity mixed with his sophisticated disposition toward perversion might be overcome. He was in Juvenile Hall for several months until he was released in the early summer of 1945, but that fall, shortly after his 14th birthday, he stole a car, got arrested, and was sent to the California Youth Authority's Fred Nell's School in Whittier, which is a residential facility for juvenile male offenders. Oh, he is not wasting any time. Absolutely not. Ken stayed there from October of 1945 to February of 1947, and he later reported that he engaged in homosexual behavior. Once he was released from the facility, he went back to live with his mother in Bakersfield, and he started the ninth grade, but he was so far behind academically. In December of 1947, when he was 16, as the legal records put it, he was, quote, Arrested as a homosexual. And this was for public sex acts. So, okay then. Wow. Yep. Uh, That happened. Yeah, I kind of, (laughs) yeah. Just ridiculous, but okay. (sighs) It's fucked. (laughs) Yeah. He was released to his mother's custody, and two months later, he stole another car and was sent to California Youth Authority's Lancaster facility. He escaped a few weeks later and went back to Bakersfield because, he said, there was a young boy there that he was sexually attracted to. Son of a bitch. Yeah. He was arrested and placed in the Kern County Jail in Bakersfield, and he attempted to end his life by drinking disinfectant. He received emergency treatment at Kern General Hospital. Then he went to the state mental hospital at Napa for 90 days. Before his time was up, he escaped and went to San Francisco, stole another car, and went back to Bakersfield to see the young boy that he could not stop thinking about. No! This is just unreal, okay? He was arrested again and returned to the Lancaster facility, and he stayed there until he was 17 years old, and he was released in May of 1949 and, of course, moved back to Bakersfield. He started working at several jobs, but they did not last long. 
He was a kitchen worker at Kern General Hospital. He worked at Smith's Market and a Sears store. He was living at home with his mother, got married to Patsy Jo Dorton, and she also moved in with his mother. On March 20th of 1951, Ken was driving his mother's car and he approached three young grade school boys that were playing near Kern General Hospital. He flashed a fake deputy sheriff's badge at them that he had just purchased at Bakersfield Army Navy surplus store that morning. He talked to the boys and convinced nine-year-old Bobby Green to get in the car with him, and he drove to a remote area in the Kern River Canyon, and he sexually assaulted him. Ken was 19 at this time, so this is a lot happening already in his life. And he thought to himself, huh, I should murder this boy so that he can't tell. But luckily, he decided not to do that. Megan, I stopped breathing. I saw it. I literally (laughs) stopped breathing. Yeah. Oh. So instead, he drove the boy back to the hospital and just dropped him off and left. Bobby went home. And told his parents what happened. And on March 26th of 1951. He told his parents? Yeah. Little Bobby did. Oh, shit. So, like, they didn't... Did they do anything about it? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> sure did. Um. So, his father signed a complaint against Ken before Justice of the Peace Stuart Maggie, alleging that Ken had committed three felonies on his son. Uh, quote... And and this is real gross. Brace, bracing, bracing, okay. First count child stealing. Second count the infamous crime against nature. Parnell had anally sodomized the boy. Third count the act of copulating the sexual organ. So. And I, uh, I wouldn't have gone through that, but I just wanted to make sure that we have, like, the record of what he's being charged with here. Ken was arrested at Sears. At this time, it was actually called Sears Roebuck. Just I am so, my brain is still trying to catch up to you right now. I know. It's a lot. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, okay. Keep, yeah. Sorry. Keep You're going. Fine. I get it. It's so much. I've been living in this story for several weeks now. Justice of the Peace, Maggie offered him the opportunity to retain an attorney, but he declined. He was asked the following questions. Did you take Bobby Green? Did you commit the infamous crime against his nature? The complaint says there's a violation of Section 288A. Did that occur in Kern County? Ken replied, yes, sir, to all three questions. He admitted to flashing a fake badge and coercing one of the boys into the car, and he described the sexual assault on Bobby Green. Deputy D.A. Clayton Cochran asked what he did, and Ken said he told the boy to get out so he could stretch his legs. They walked up a hill, sat down to talk. He told him what he was going to do to him, and then he did it. I will not go into a lot of detail about the assault. Yeah, I appreciate Um, that. But Ken did confirm that Bobby cried and did not want to do these acts. He also admitted that he briefly considered strangling him afterwards. He later admitted that the reason that he, you know, was telling them or confessing to everything at this time was because at that age, the fear of prison was greater than confessing to anything. He was told that if he confessed to everything and did what he was told, he would go to a hospital instead of a prison. So that was the motivation. Oh, right. That's why he did it. Okay. Mm-hmm. I was wondering why he was just giving that information right up. Yeah. Probable cause had been shown that Ken was guilty of all three counts. So he was sent to Kern County Jail. His mother hired private attorney Wiley C. Doris to represent him. Since Ken had already testified that he was guilty... He felt that the only thing they could do was to have him agree to be bound over to Kern County Superior Court to plead guilty. He was bound over, but nine days later, Mary bonded him out of jail by paying $50 to the National Automobile and Casualty Insurance Company to write his $5,000 bond. And 
That's actually where we're going to end this one. Yeah. I know. Okay. You know what? I think I'm everyone okay needs it. a break here. I was just going to say I'm actually okay with this yeah. one because I truly do need a break. Yeah. I get it. You, like, shattered me a thousand times over. Mm -hmm. And I need to watch Disney not because, like, I'm, like, scared, but because I'm disgusted and shattered and... There's a lot of emotions. Feeling a lot of feels right now. <laughs> oh, no, you're feeling a lot and of I feels. And I need Disney to fix me. <laughs> yeah, I get it. <laughs> All right, so make sure to follow us on any of your podcast apps. Tell us the stories you want to hear. Like us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Leave us a five-star review if you love us. Tell your friends. Tell your cats. Um, Bye. bye.